This is Cents Per Mile, featuring Charles Gracie, Paul Gibson, and Josh Haynes. Everyone knows the trucking industry has issues, but most people are afraid to talk about it. Someone's got to do it. With loads of recruiting and marketing experience, and backed by the largest driver audience in the world, we deliver carriers the driver perspective, we find solutions, and help make sense make sense. Thank you for tuning in the Sense Per Mile. I'm your host, Charles Gracie. Hey, I'm Josh Haynes. Charles, what are we talking about today on this new episode of Sense Per Mile? We're talking trucking, and we have an expert industry panel to help us. Expert industry panel is a mouthful, but not as much as a mouthful as uh, the thing that I got to say. We are on uh, every platform there is, iHeartRadio, Apple, Amazon, FedEx, if they had one. You know, we're on all of them. Find us, rate us. Um, what else can they do, Charles? You can also go to sensepermilepodcast.com where you can submit a topic to be a guest or to even be a sponsor. We also have a festival coming up, um, which I'm pretty pumped on because that means I get to get out of the office and see people's faces. Uh, why don't you tell us a little more about that? It's the Festival of Freight, F3, the future of the freight industry by freight waves i mean it's right here in chattanooga so i'm excited for all the people that are going to be coming into my hometown and i'm super excited that i don't have to get on a plane after the whole big you know fiasco that's happening right now so hopefully they figure that out by then but i'm not going to hold my breath but there's a cool link in the description you should hit it gives you a nice discount uh, that runs out at the end of the month so you want to go ahead and get your tickets now it's a little bit more than half off and i'll see you in chattanooga Saving money in this economy is uh, always appreciated. All right, so we have uh, this expert panel, Charles, which um, I feel like I'm going to get tongue-tied saying that too many times. So why don't you go ahead and go down the list of who these experts are and uh, everyone that's going to be on today's episode. So first, I want to start by saying that we brought in the best, the brightest, the biggest names in the trucking industry for this episode. Charles, Charles. Charles, I'm, I'm, I'm already on the episode. You don't have to fluff me like that, you know. Oh, you're talking about the other guests. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we got Driver's Legal Plan, and we got Lizette joining us from them. We got Brian Weebold from 10th Street. We got Ryan from Tafts, Merle from Hello Retention, Brian from Decker, and Robert from MVT. So welcome to Sense Per Mile, guys and girls. Good to be here. Thank you for having us. Hello. Good to be here. Good to be here. Excited. <laughs> yes. So we got some great news articles thanks to CDL Life, you know, covering the top trucking topics. I talk about a mouthful. Uh, the first one is the FMCSA to allow carriers to swap convoy cameras for rear vision mirrors. Um, so this article just came out a couple of days ago. Actually, yesterday, the FMCSA okayed a request from a technology company to allow carriers to use their camera systems as an alternative to standard rear vision mirrors. Um, they granted the exception uh, exemption for this. So it's interesting to see how they're going to work this because I know that you already have trucks on the road that's got cameras instead of mirrors. I was actually in one of them for one of my clients over in Chicago and got to drive it around and... I'll tell you, it takes a little getting used to. Uh, they still have these iPads mounted to the inside quarter panels uh, by the front window, but it takes some getting used to. You're used to seeing things move uh, outside of the window and you're training your eyes. It was a little distracting for me. So, you know, hopefully uh, all the drivers coming into the work funnel for trucking companies played a lot of Forza. Uh, the next article is the CDC's. August 1st crackdown on dogs crossing the border. Uh, we talked about this in a previous episode. It's right around the corner. It's going to make it very hard for drivers to cross the border if they have one of their furry friends in the truck because they're going to have to have a basically a note from the doctor uh, or the vet in this case that's going to be no more than six months of age at the time. So Imagine having your dog and like, hold on, dispatch. I got to go home. I got to make an appointment for the vet because we're crossing the border. And uh, I, I got Fido over here and I don't want him to get left. So are you saying, are you saying eventually they will have like doggy passports? Is that, is that, is that what I'm kind of understanding now? But you, you got truck parking club out there solving the parking shortage. What if there was like a truck parking club mobile vet? That just sitting there, like, you know how you sit outside the, you know how you got the mechanics that sit outside the scales waiting for people to get down? Now, now right next to them is a vet. Or, I mean, 
could be the same person. I'd be a little worried, but you know, opportunities there. Uh, I'm going to call upon one of our uh, industry experts on this one because this is a interesting topic. Robert, you're always fun on these topics. So, I mean, what kind of entrepreneurship ideas do you have on this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's easier to have a co-driver than a pet. <laughs> it depends on who you're asking. Have you ever had to share that truck with somebody? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's true. So is this to make sure they have all their shots and they're not sick? Yeah, but it, it, the the stressor on this, Brian, is the fact that it's, it has to be within six months. So, I mean, essentially, a driver doesn't even know if they're crossing the border six months ahead. Whoever whoever wasted time on this legislation should like really focus on bathroom access, universal pay. Does that apply to service dogs as well? It doesn't specify, but I, I imagine that's going to be one of those topics down the line that we're going to have to... Uh, kind of keep covering this because what if it's a service i'd assume it has to it's still a dog i mean and i'm curious how they'll regulate it how how do they know with all the different vets that are out there how are they going to know if it's legit paperwork from a vet that you know over here in kansas and you know i have all this how are they going to validate that it's all legit have you seen how physicals for drivers have been done you had chiropractors doing those ryan (laughs) 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 they just cracked your back and it's like turn your head and cough (laughs) I can't wait for that conversation where I run somebody's background and instead of clearing house, I'm going to have to say, your dog's on the clearing house. We're going to have to turn you down. We're going to, we're going to, have, to, we're going to have to build this into 10th Street now. This is great. <laughs> Why they're uploading their med cards and their CDL. Can you uh, upload all your doggy documentation? <laughs> you can call it the doggy document center. Our next article is kind of an exciting one because we're always talking about the shortage of truck stops and parking. Well, Traverse, Travel Centers of America opens four locations in South Carolina, Oregon, and Nevada. Um, they have one TA Cowpens in South Carolina. It's going to have over 80 free truck parking spaces, uh, six private showers. Then you're going to have Coburg, Oregon with 100 free truck parking spaces and laundry facilities. And then Egg Oasis, I probably murdered that, but I'll apologize for whatever town I just butchered. Uh, They're actually going to have a McDonald's and 50 car parking spaces, but nothing for truck parking. A little scary. And then uh, also one uh, Casino Road in Henderson, Nevada. It's going to have 200 paved truck parking spaces with 20 paid ones. So that's kind of exciting. That's a nice big one. So, I mean, here we are, we're at a new truck stops. We know you got truck parking club out there offering parking and there's kind of a debate on, you know, whether paid parking versus free parking. If you have paid parking, you're taken away from the free parking, but we're adding new truck stops at least. Yeah. I I can tell you that most drivers will tell you they've been in a position within at least once to twice a week where they've been forced to park on the side of the road on an off ramp. Uh, So there's still a need there. Anything that brings parking, I'd like it to be free, but ideally there's obviously a supply and demand issue. So there's a market that's willing to pay for it. Um, With that said, there's certain stretches of the country. I recently this past weekend drove from Oklahoma city back to El Paso, approximately a 10, 12 hour drive. And I can tell you, I, because I have no life. I counted 16 different trucks that were parked on the side of the road and you could tell they shut down for the night. So there's definitely still the demand out there that's not been met yet. So anything that expedites that process of more parking, be it paid or unpaid, I'm a fan of. Absolutely. And so that's going to bring us to our first topic for all of our experts in the room. We're talking about truck parking solutions. Can it be used as a benefit? Can it be used for retention? And is free parking versus paid parking as big of a deal as some people might be making it out to be? Uh, Brian from Decker, what's uh, your thoughts on this? You know, any any secure parking where we can be safe is, is a good thing for us. Um, our night dispatch spends a, a fair amount of time just helping drivers out finding parking, whether that's getting on Google Maps and looking up uh, uh, locations to park or, you know, calling people and see if we can get them in. So, we don't want anyone on the side of the road. We want them to be safe. We want them to be secure. So, uh, but yeah, I understand there's so many rules with these truck stops on how, how far they can be built from each other and, and all the regulations they, they put upon themselves. So 
anything is great. Uh, as far as paid goes this year, anything that's free, we really, really appreciate. <laughs> till, Q, till Q2 next year, yeah, we'll take everything free. So, Merle, you're in the retention side of things. One of the thoughts I've always had on this is, you know, a lot of people throw out bonuses. A lot of people throw out pay raises and all that stuff that changes. But what about offering paid truck parking? It's like uh, you pay for the driver's truck parking as a method of retention. Has that ever come across your plate? It hasn't yet. I mean, it's an idea. But I think in this economic time, I think everybody would prefer free parking. Um, you know, there's so many malls that are closing down throughout the United States. I don't know how they can't come up with a solution. Hey, let drivers park there overnight and get their, their 10 hour breaks or their resets and things like that. It's wasted parking lot space. Um, but it hadn't come across my desk yet as far as a, as a retention tool, but you know, it all depends on the client too. You know, it's, a lot of clients have dedicated terminals and that's where drivers are stopping in and doing their resets if they're not on the road. So just kind of, Every company is a little different, so you have to kind of analyze that and, and see what works best. And then if the opportunity comes up, we present it, and the companies say, yeah, we can make this work, or we can't make it work. So so it's funny you talked about all that wasted space. So I was on PTO last week. I drove up to Chicago, and yes, it's about to be an Illinois joke. Um, but someone had asked me to come on to a, a show, and I was over there hanging out in the logistics lounge, and uh, they're like, hey, where are you at? I'm like, I'm in Chicago. And I, it popped in my head that that entire state could be turned into a truck parking club location. I drove through it. I didn't miss it at all. It was just constant traffic. It was a headache. Uh, I was paying like almost five bucks for a gallon of gas, uh, and, my, and my truck is not green friendly. Anyone that's seen it, like the only green that goes in there is comes out of my bank account. Um, so it was just one of those things though. Uh, we took that ride and to Robert's point, we kept seeing trucks parked on the ramps. I mean, it was early in the evening, uh, and the travel centers were packed. The truck stops were packed. You'd see them parked along the side of the road. It's not safe. And one of the ideas I've always had to what I mentioned to Earl, Merle earlier was the fact of using that as a retention tool, possibly, you know, I know carriers are like, Oh, thanks, Charles. You're giving us another expense to think about, but I'm, as a former driver, if you gave me paid truck parking and a shortage of truck parking options, that's a benefit to me. So it's one of the things that helps us at MVT. We run engineered lanes. So all of our origin and destination points, we have a drop yard or a terminal or some kind of thing. So our drivers don't really have to worry about parking from that standpoint. The exception to that is for more of a long haul driver that we might have that's going to be somewhere halfway in between between loads uh, that have to find it. But I can tell you there's a lot of our drivers in particular where we have a higher concentration in Texas to where they very rarely are going to have to park at a truck stop. Um, and I can tell you from a retention standpoint, we have people that we are able to see the visibility of when a verification comes. And we talk to the driver to get that driver to stay with us. One of the things they will point to is, well, this company I checked out, needs me to park the truck at my house. I live in an apartment complex. I can't do that. Um, so that's one of the benefits with a large distribution of terminals or drop yards is drivers may not make their hiring decision based off of it, but they will keep that in mind. How easy is it to leave you if they're going to have to worry about where to park a truck and a trailer. Leading up to this, we put out a questionnaire to our audience, our followers, and asked them for a couple questions that they wanted to hear answers from, from you, the experts. So one of the questions that I have here is in today's market for carriers looking for drivers being much different than the past, what are some things carriers can do to be more successful now than where they maybe have fallen short in the last year? Brian, you got any insights on this for us? Yeah, so I just got back from a, a, a state executive trucking association uh, conference. And one of the discussions they had were, was obviously hiring drivers. And they're looking at, of course, veterans and, and women one of the biggest things that struck me was focusing on foster care, kids aging out of foster care, having nothing to do. I think they make less than $8,000 a year after they are booted out of the system. And so there's actually organizations forming to approach foster care to begin, much like we're doing with veterans and with women's issues to, um, you know, engage those as well. 
but the main thing is, is that you just really need to do a thorough inspection of where you're looking for drivers, what you're currently doing, uh, and talk to uh, recruiting, third-party recruiters, talk to 10th Street, talk to whoever, and just get some ideas. And we'll do that. We're happy to do that no charge and just talk to companies um, because drivers are out there, and I think that we're able to uh, to locate them if we We'll just all work together, but we've got to become creative and maybe innovative in the way that we are looking for drivers. That's an awesome takeaway. And that's interesting that I, I would have never thought of looking in the foster, but you see them looking in the veterans. You see them looking into all kinds of different funnels to try to pull drivers out of. I can't imagine they won't find some that want to transition in the trucking. Yeah, not just driving, other other opportunities in the trucking industry, you know, internal operations or maintenance and those type of things. Uh, and just getting them apprenticeship programs and getting the training uh, or scholarship offers to, to learn trucking and get involved and, and start a career because, you know, those people are looking for something to do when they no longer have housing or, or uh, any other type of income coming in. You know, so I think we, we have an opportunity there. Absolutely. So from a carrier's perspective, Brian uh, Schaefer, what's some of the things that you're seeing that carriers can do to prime their efforts in today's market? Because, I mean, back in the day, all you had to do was show up and answer the phone. And it seems like more today is like dialing for donuts. You know, really, it's um, you want to get your, your culture and your core value out there. And drivers are looking for a fit. And, you know, and I tell everyone, no company changes just because you want to come to work for us. So make sure, you know, you're, you're going to align with what our expectations are, uh, what the goals are. Uh, and it's, you know, put it on the website. Um, I think all of us were seeing a lot more people applying direct to a company in the last few months than, than going through, say, a job board or an agency or anything like that. So people are doing the research. Um, so, you know, one, beef up your website. Get the get the right information out there, but then start with the recruiter. You know, we're we're driven to be the best, and then when they come to orientation, they need to see we're driven to be the best. This is our this is our motto. This is our slogan. These are our core values, and we just need to repeat them, repeat them, repeat them, and say, you know, everyone's going to get you miles. Everyone's going to get you home. Everyone's going to do all that. But are you going to be happy and and satisfied? And that's where the retention stays. It's funny that you get into that retention part uh brian because our next question from our audience is driver retention seems to be a top priority item for a lot of carriers when it's slim pickings in the hiring funnel for today's drivers what are some surefire ways that carriers can position themselves to retain the drivers for the long haul merle i think this is right up your alley my guy i tell you and, and robert can speak to this is communication with these drivers i say this all the time when you're touching base with that driver every single week, having that conversation, what's going good, what's going ugly, what's what's going on? And it doesn't have to always be work related, but somehow work relates back into it. So driver just had their home time. Hey, how was your home time? What'd you do? And it's not just about, hey, did you get that load? Did you get in the truck? You're having just general conversations. And in that general conversation, the driver's gonna let you know, hey, everything's good. I'm great you know, talk to you next week, or the driver's going to say, hey, I'm having a little issue here, 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 and then we just escalate that up, but the fact that we're communicating with them every single week, and vice versa, they're sometimes calling us before we even get to calling them, so we're building that trust and camaraderie and culture, um, not only as a rep for the company, but they feel like we're part of the company at the same time, even though we're, we're just a service for the company, so it's that partnership that goes all the way around between hella retention, the company and the driver and simple communication makes them feel welcomed and at ease and cared about. It's crazy communication, but part of the communication that we've gotten on that question when I was put out there was also what kind of benefits can a carrier offer a driver that will help them stand out. And I wanted to kind of turn this one to you, Lizette, because you, you work with a company that is a benefit not only to the carrier, but also the driver. So can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, so offering benefits to the drivers just gives them more of an opportunity to say, hey, you have my back. You know, um, you care about me and my livelihood and while I'm on the road. A lot of the times, you know, they're they're put into trucks and 
even though safety is the number one in trucking um, topic of industry, no one really gives that opportunity or resources to a lot of the drivers, especially these new companies. So us being a law firm, we're free to the carriers. We're protecting the drivers at a very affordable cost to protect a simple thing that they live off their livelihood, which is their CDL license. And just being able to give them that information and that knowledge, which there's thousands and thousands of violations and you know, things that they have to deal with on a daily basis and give them that support that they need in case of an any incident or any violation that they deal with or, you know, they deal with a lot of law enforcement and DOT compliances and so many regulations through the FMCSA that, you know, are coming out, but no driver knows about the new, you know, regulations and new laws. They're just out on the road and just having that barrier or that safety as a background, it's just keeps them at ease of mind saying, hey, I can keep my CDL license. I can continue working. I have something to provide for my family. I have financial, you know, stability. So it's just an ease of mind for those drivers. That's some great insights. And so that brings me to one of the topics that were submitted to us, which was, I marked it as one of our hot button, hot take topics, driver wages and the solutions for such. So we talk about benefits. We talk about all the efforts that go into attracting today's top talent for your carriers, but the wages, that's something that's, it's been the same for so long and certain people are breaking away and sometimes it's easier than others. You know, R Ryan, you work with a bunch of different carriers, you know, money makes the world go round. What's some of the things that you think that carriers can do to help fix the wage solution or wage situation for today's drivers? Yeah, I think obviously on, on our end, we deal with a lot of independent owner operators that, that are out there. Um, but again, it comes down to just transparency and relationships. Um, you know, when, when you're out there, whether you're negotiating for the rate on a freight or when you're taking on a new job, um, you know, just making sure that you're finding out all the details of how things are going to operate, um, you know, and then building those relationships um, with your debtors and your brokers that are out there. Because obviously the more money that there is on the load, that's where more profit. So whether it's money going into your pocket or it's money going back into the driver's pocket, um, you know, it's, it's always good just to, to build those relationships and, and get to know who you're working for. Because, you know, the more money you can make on the freight, everyone's just going to win that way. Yeah. I mean, I worked with carriers that they have tried to redo their pay packages. They tried to go to an hourly rate. They tried to go to a pay daily rate. Uh, and it, it's not received. Everyone thinks, oh, the driver's going to welcome it with open arms. But there's such a distrust in pay packages over the years because of all the rope-a-dope scenarios that I've seen a lot of drivers kind of think that they're going to be work like a government mule. And we have to communicate them. We have to be very transparent in those pay packages. That's their livelihood and be receptive to having those conversations. So from a carrier standpoint, Robert, you know, in your experience, what's some of the ways that we can make the wages more fair and more transparent for today's drivers? Uh, I think it covers the previous topic too. I think it's developing career pathways. So we are very short sighted in this industry. We are literally, I want to fill a truck this week. I want to have you move freight for me this week. Where if I hire any other position, generally we talk to somebody about their career development path, how they can grow, how they can get in the new areas of the business. We don't do that as an industry much with drivers. Uh, it's one of those opportunities that traditionally, you know, when a carrier would get a new dedicated account or some high paying opportunity, they would previously use that for recruiting to go out and find somebody when in actuality, you can develop the, the drivers you already have into those positions of your business's future. So as an example, it may be with us, we get a driver that has no endorsements and needs to be home every week. But down the line, we may get an opportunity that if you get your passport, you'll go to Canada and may get an extra couple hundred dollars a week because an opportunity crops up. Instead of bringing that to recruiting, it's from an operational standpoint of let's manage our people, let's develop career pathways and make our drivers more in line with our operational needs as they change over the years. It's a much more long-term approach. It challenges your operations team, your sales team, and a number of other departments. But if you can give your driver a pathway of, hey, we're going to work towards something together, we do it with every other position in a trucking company. 
your recruiters, you talk, hey, where do you want to be in five years? If you can have that career development path conversation with a driver, it's going to help you short term retention wise. And it's going to be much more cost effective to hire from within than to go into the open market and find somebody that may be further advanced in their career. Real quick, Charles, on that, um, and I don't know if anybody else can answer this too, but obviously on, on my end with the independent owner operators, we've seen a lot of one truck owner operators that have turned in, you know, started as drivers and, and turned into, you know, companies that now operate 100, 150 trucks. Um, but there are a lot of times people that were company drivers somewhere else got into dispatching, went through safety. So they've seen the full side of it. So do you guys look to take some of the drivers and move them into internal spots or or when you bring them in, ask if that's their career path? Because I've seen a lot of great success with, you know, they were drivers, but that wasn't where they inspired to be. They just wanted to get in the industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll say in particular uh, in operations, uh, a driver gets excited when their fleet manager, as an example, has a CDL or has driven for you before and knows the customers intimately. They like that a lot. We have safety personnel we do that with. Um, the more you can sprinkle in CDL holders that physically work for you throughout the business, I believe it gives you a certain level of credibility. But the other part of that equation is the driver has such a unique job and unique experience that the more people you have that can relate to it, that know that it took place and what happens on the road, especially when handling a problem, um, that tends to go a lot easier. And so it's one of those things that depending on the job and personality, not everybody's a perfect fit for each job, but the more that you can do that, uh, drivers respect the effort. Yeah, I can attest to that because I mean, I worked at a carrier as a driver and then I moved into the driver trainer role and then I'm not going to name the carrier cause everyone in this room might go after them for introducing me to you all. But, uh, they moved me into the office. Now, I don't know what they were thinking. They put me in safety first. Yeah. <laughs> Choices were made, but it, it was. It was nice to see them reaching out and taking people and offering them pathways, and I don't think it's done enough in the industry. Charles, if I could, so this is really interesting uh, to hear you talk about this. So 10th Street handles a lot of drivers, and we, we communicate with drivers quite a bit and survey. So... Uh, we talked to them a little bit about, all right, pay, home time, routes, got it. That's important to you. Beyond that, what is it that keeps you loyal to a carrier, right? And the number one thing was, and there was all kind of different responses, but the gist of it was they want to be treated like a human being and not a commodity. They feel, Mind blowing. They feel like they're just like freight, right? So... That's number one is, is I'm a human being and, and having drivers and other positions in the company that understand drivers is important. Second thing is they, they begin to configure their attitude of trust toward a, a carrier based upon the first uh, recruiting call. So what they hear from that recruiter at the outset, if it doesn't pan out, if the pay's not right, or they make promises that aren't kept, the equipment is top notch, they get there and it's crap, that begins to configure the lack of trust into the carrier that they're currently working with. And so these people are human beings. So having that empathy, you know, Christensen Trucking is doing a great thing. They're doing like internal research about a driver centric culture. All right. So just think about that for a second. What if a trucking company's culture was driver centric and understanding your drivers and the cycle that they're in, you know, they're lonely, they need community, they need more pay, uh, they're looking for fulfillment. And so it's just a very interesting uh, dive into the psyche of a driver, but they want to be treated as human beings and understood and, and received that way. Thank you guys for this. Cause you guys are lining me up for each question perfectly. So the next question that came in from our driver audience was, we're starting to see a shift of drivers wanting to do OTR versus local regional work due to the home work-life balance. How can a carrier better position themselves either internally or operationally to handle this via verbally or in restructuring? Uh, you know, I know someone in this room that's actually lived through that. So Robert, you know, 
you guys kind of did that over there. I, I was part of it when you were going through it. It seemed like a headache, but you guys endured it and it's worked out for you. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think that the more you can be able to take drivers that are different, not one size fits all, it's going to give you a lot of versatility in what you can offer. And what driver's value varies from one driver to the next. I can tell you there's the person that wants to be home every night. There's the person that wants to be home multiple times a week. And there's there are people that want to be out significantly longer than that. But there's a reason why they want that. It might be pay. It might be the nature of their home time. So we have some drivers that are okay doing their 34-hour reset and then leaving out immediately. We have other folks that, you know, I need a good three, four days because I, I need to have a life where I get to kind of re-energize. Part of it is that conversation at the very beginning with a recruiter. Talk to the driver. What are their wants? What are the needs? Once you get past, are you qualified? Once you get past, hey, do you have the experience that we need? It's not a quick two-minute conversation. It may be a 15, 20-minute conversation about where do you want to be six months from now? What has you going home? One of the things I tell any recruiter is, look, if you know that driver's pet's name, their spouse's name, how many kids they have without asking anything illegal on the phone. But if, when you start knowing those things, you've now built a relationship that you're going to put the driver in the best position to be successful. Because if you continue to put a square peg into a round hole, they aren't staying. And it's not that they're bad or you're bad, but you're literally trying to force something that doesn't go together. So I would like to go around and ask each one of you to contribute one thing that should go on a driver's bill of rights. You know, I'm going to I'm going to dovetail off Robert said, because what he said has really resonated with me was about the right to advancement within the company. The driver's bill of rights should be able to voice their opinions, thoughts and concerns without being judged, belittled or disgraced. I mean, the easy one is be able to take your dog across the border. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, that there's a lot of ways you can go with this, but, but I think just the, the giving them more of an understanding of how important they are in the industry um, and just in, in the economy um, than they're actually portrayed. I'm going to go with uh, free internet. Free internet everywhere. Gotcha. That's important. Yeah, they should put a 5K router in that truck and with their epic view and now you can stream video. If you can't be home, you might as well be comfortable and you, and you got to be able to communicate with home. So I'm actually going to go with the free parking though. I kind of go back and forth with that because I just feel like drivers shouldn't be responsible for the parking. If anything, it should be again, you know, towards the company or, you know, or even the, you know, the TAs or, you know, the, the truck stops itself, it should be implemented in the cost of price that, you know, if they purchase X amount, you know, they get free parking, something, some type of incentive to where it's not coming out of the driver's pocket. You know, it, they shouldn't have to pay for a shower. The right to get somebody on the phone. And it's really simple, but I'll, what I word by this is we should utilize technology to the fullest. I love an in cab communication system. I think there's a lot of advantages to making sure that you have technology to where you can communicate easily, but there's unique problems. There's unique circumstances that in any other line of work, I generally can talk to somebody. Um, and it becomes really important because you feel like a second rate citizen if there's nobody that you can physically talk to. Where if I have a problem, I, I can go 10, 10 feet down the hall here and I can talk to somebody. We, we forget that that is a luxury in most drivers, especially on nights and weekends. Um, it's one of those things that having somebody physically active and talking to you becomes really important, especially in a problem that might not get solved within the next five to 10 minutes. That voice is significant and reduces a problem from escalating into something major. Nice. Well, I'm going to add one in there. I want to add the right to a healthy living options, whether that's gym, food options on the road, exercise options while they're on the road. You know, I think this is one of those things that kind of plays into everything we're talking about. If they can't pass the DOT physical, they can't drive. If they can't live healthy and live a long life, they can't drive. So I'm going to choose that only because I've been in that seat and I saw what it was like to go from 165 to 200. And I get it. All right. Well, 
I want to give a huge shout out to all of you guys for joining us. This was one of those things where a lot of our audience had questions. You being the experts had the answers. So huge shout out to you guys, not only for coming on the show, but also for your support of the show. So if anyone wanted to reach out to you guys, how would they find you? Uh, they could reach out either online at uh, TAFS.com or they can give us a call at 913-393-6100. Really easily go to our website, check out all the information at drive4mvt.com. That's drive4mvt.com. HelloRetention.com or find me on LinkedIn, Merle Gerhardt. And uh, my number's there. And it's my cell number, so you can always get me. 10street.com or it's brian.webold at 10street.com. Um, you can check out our website at driverslegal, uh, driverslegalplan.com, or you can give me a call at 405-606-8137. Uh, drivedecker.com, so drivedecker.com, or 877-233-2537. All right. Well, like all good things that come to an end, thank you for tuning in to Cents Per Mile. I'm your host, Charles Gracie. And I'm Josh Haynes. We'll see you next time. Peace.